Greetings in Jesus' name. Welcome to all of you. Welcome visitors. Trust we can continue to be blessed. The last verse in the one song spoke to me. It was, I believe in God. I believe in a God. I believe in God. I believe in a love that is true and tender. For God in his love... For God in his love send it down from above. I believe in a love even when I can't feel it. Tony said that God loves us all equally. Sometimes we don't feel it as much as other times. But I still believe it's there. I can't, when I can't feel it, in this cold and empty world. Just this past week, we again heard a report on the crisis in Ukraine. Do you think the Ukrainians would describe the world as cold and empty? Do you think they feel the love of God right now? I know that some of them do. I trust that most do. This morning, I saw the full moon in the western sky. I always marvel how God created us and blessed us with sleep. Almost every morning I wake up refreshed. And I think about it, going to bed tired. And then waking up with a completely different attitude and yes my attitude sometimes changes overnight isn't it a miracle isn't sleep a miracle and i trust that we have something to bless god for that we can experience the miracle of sleep the beauty of the morning god has blessed us with a beautiful morning i believe a week ago the forecast was a chance of rain this morning. And I thought I'm going to be okay with that. But I'm blessed that God proved the meteorologists wrong. God doesn't need to send us weather according to the meteorologists. Again, thank you for being here. A uh, few announcements before uh, we have the message. And I invite you ushers to prepare for the offering. Lord willing, in two weeks, we want to move ahead with receiving a number of uh, applicants into full membership. Doug Haldeman, Brandon and Melissa Hirschberger, Kim and Chris Haldeman. We want to move ahead with, full with receiving them as full membership in two weeks. And if you have any uh, concerns or any reason that we can't proceed with that, please let us know. But again, Lord willing, in two weeks we will receive them as, as uh, full members. Previously we had announced that Craig and Bega are moving to Wayne County. And I believe I saw it in the notes somewhere. Things have changed a little bit for them. Doors have opened for them to stay. And I believe it was last Sunday they requested publicly to become members down in Belize. So Lord willing, they will stay in Belize. They, uh, he calls it tent-making missionaries. So he's finding work to support him, uh, his family and, and they're gonna, they would like to transfer their uh, membership. 
So they requested a transfer letter uh, that we will grant him or grant them. Uh, just point out, Wednesday evening there is no prayer meeting, uh, no service at sunlight. Uh, Honey Run School program is at Day Springs, which affects quite a number of us. So no Wednesday evening service. Birthdays this week, two of them on Thursday, Melody Lead and Denver Steiner have a birthday on Thursday. Brielle Geyser has one on Friday. So happy birthday to all of you this week that are celebrating another year. Normally we have a guest speaker at our outdoor service. We're glad that Brother Stephen Yoder ad agreed to come and preach this morning, share the message of God. He is a friend and a brother-in-law. So I would consider him a friend, a brother, and a brother-in-law. <clears throat> so to qualify that, he is married to my sister. So you are truly my brother-in-law. So I invite all of you to stand before the message, and then we'll invite him forward to, to share with us. And after Afterwards, he will turn the time over to Brother Keith, and I'll ask Keith to close the service then, uh, remembering the noon meal. Maybe I should have announced that, that the, there is a noon meal prepared for everyone that's here. You're welcome to stay. If you're brave enough, the men provided the food, prepared the food, and provided for it. So. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we again come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we open our hearts to you, ask that you would minister to our hearts, pray that your word can come forth in a way that can be clear, meaningful, and touch our lives exactly where we're at. Thank you for Brother Steve, ask that you would use him as a vessel in your hand, ask that you would bless him for being a willing servant, pray that your word We bring glory to yourself. Again, we commit our lives to you. We open ourselves and trust you to meet our needs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I also want to greet you in Christ's name. I don't know if you noticed, Bert was a little bit slow identifying with me, but that's okay. We're still brothers in Christ and brother-in-laws. I was blessed as well with the beautiful weather we had this morning. It is a very beautiful morning as we were sitting here I heard the I think the cardinals and other birds chirping and singing and <clears throat> you know when I hear that a lot of times I think that you know the the creation in the animal world and, and the creation as at a, as a whole is still what God created them for and uh, how are we faring sometimes are we sometimes following what God wants us to do. I was blessed with the fact of the children's class seeing all the children up here and <clears throat> excuse me then the announcement that you're taking in new members and in the prayer room I heard that you're having baptismal. The church is growing and that's a blessing. I want to bless you for that. Now the message is kind of geared towards you what part of this growth are you? What are you doing to enhance this growth? The title of the message is God's Chosen Vessel. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with this small pulpit up here or podium, but we'll make it somehow. Let's read the account in Acts 9 where, where Jesus made... Uh, spoke these words to, to uh, 
Paul. In Acts 9. <clears throat> It's the account of, uh, I'll just read it here. <clears throat> and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonishing and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose again from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. <clears throat> and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and he said unto the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand upon him, on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all, thy, all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bring my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way that, as thou comest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. I believe I'll cease reading there. It continues on how he received his sight, and straightway he went, and he essayed to become part of the church. But Jesus said <clears throat> to Ananias that he is a chosen vessel. What is he speaking about when he says he is a vessel? When we think of a vessel, it's something that, that uh, it holds something. It, 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 it holds the, the uh, contents. So when we think of a vessel, we can think of we can think of uh, a cup. A cup is a vessel. It just holds a little bit. Or it may be a five-gallon bucket. It's, it's a vessel. Or we also call vessels, you know, when someone flies across the sea, the airplane is a vessel. So the, the important thing that we want to talk, there's two things that we want to focus on this morning. One of them is us as the vessel, but also the contents of the vessel. What is the contents in our vessel? What are we beholding? What are we uh, containing in our lives? The thing that we, we think about vessels is you know, I flew over to Europe a couple times already, and, and I remember those big airplanes, and they were beautiful, and they were, they were huge. But, you know, my focus was on getting there safely. And when I got there, I kind of forgot the airplane. And that's how it is with us. <clears throat> you know, we, we just came through Mother's Day, and probably a lot of you 
gave and a lot of you received flowers. And they were in a vessel. They were in some kind of a vessel that was containing these flowers. But unless those were real good flowers, they're probably wilted and faded already. And I'm not sure what you did with those flowers. But the vessel is probably set away somewhere. We forgot about the vessel. We forgot about the vessel and we don't, we don't after, the, after the contents is depleted, we don't set the vessel out and say, hey, look at this beautiful vessel that I received my bygone flowers. And we do that the same, we'll, we'll hit that maybe just a little bit later. <clears throat> So we know we are vessels that contain something. And I have to think of, of the, uh, was it the three or four that, that were given these talents? And I thought of that when I saw the ball, when I bought, I, I mean, I was, it, was, it was a blessing to me. I, I would have said, too, the ball is going to fall faster. Of course it is. It's bigger. It's heavier. It's going to fall faster. But when we think and relate that to the, to the men that, had the, the ta that were given the talents, they received a contents, and they did something with them. But when, they, when, the, when the contents came back, the same blessing was there. It was the same blessing. It would have fallen, it fell the same speed. What a blessing. These contents <clears throat> that we have. You know, when we, when we think of our earthen vessels that we carry the Word of God, we carry the, the we salvation that we carry in our earthen vessels. You know, after our contents passes away and goes to heaven trusting, you know, we don't, we don't remain, with, we don't keep this, this earthen vessel around us anymore. We, we take it and not only do we set it aside, we put it six foot down and we it uh, <clears throat> put it back to the earth where it comes from. So what does our what does our earthen vessel contain? What is within us? You know, here Paul was just converted. He has saved to become part of the church. He wanted to become part of the church. Now, I'm, and Bert opened it up here. That if there's anything that would come up, you know, it seemed there was a lot of things there in, in the church there that this Paul was. No, we don't want him part of our church. He persecuted the the Christians. But he has said, he was determined, he tried, he wanted to be part of this church. And it wasn't long after that, we would continue on in Acts 11 already, <clears throat> where they wanted to worship him. And you know, vessels have been worshipped. Vessels have been bowed down to. People have been worshipped. People have been bowed down to. But it's simply the contents that we carry within us that's holy, that's righteous, and it's not because of us. <clears throat> and people were, there in Acts 14, people were worshiping Paul because of who he was and what he preached and what he taught. But by verse 19, there was a group of people that came and they, they tried to stone this vessel. They tried to kill this vessel. They drug him out and they left him for dead. <clears throat> Yet even though they tried to do that to Saul, even though they did all that to the, in the Reformation and all the persecution and, the, and everything that has happened in, in time, if we go to the martyr's mirror, we see things that how people have stood, their contents that they had within their earthen vessels, it has not been depleted, it has not died, they have not been able to put it away, and it still stands. <clears throat> Yet, yet the contents of the vessels, the, the love of God, the truth of God, the holiness of God, the word of God, salvation that he has brought to mankind has not been tainted. It's still as beautiful, as real, and as pure as it was when he brought it to mankind, <clears throat> when he, when he uh, brought it to us. Now, we, I, want, I would like to look at three three different accounts in the Bible of vessels. And I, wanna, I want you to be thinking as we're going through this, that as we think of a vessel, the things that 
I'm part of a church or will be coming part of a church or would like to become part of a church or maybe you don't have a desire to become part of a church. But you are bearing, you contain something in your heart and you are contributing something somewhere. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm not part of a church, I'm not contributing anything, but you're still contributing and that is possibly a negative attitude or a unsubmissive spirit that you are contributing to society or to a church setting. <clears throat> as, as the question I want to ask you is, maybe I said it already, is what kind of a vessel, what are you containing in your heart? What, how much is it contributing? <clears throat> the first one is found in 2 King. 2 King, I want to read a few verses, the first seven verses. <clears throat> this is when, where the account where the, where the woman came to Elijah, Elisha with a question. The first seven verses of, Elijah, of 2 Kings 4. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets of Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors come to take unto him my sons, two sons, to be bondmen. <clears throat> and Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, Empty vessels, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into, the, into all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out, and it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and give thou, and live thou and thy children of the rest. <clears throat> Here we see these simple vessels that were just simply available. They probably went to the neighbors and they asked for vessels and and I was thinking this morning also of the different size of things that the Tony had, not Todd, Tony had, that, you know, they probably brought vessels, some were probably small, they thought they, they, they're almost not worth it. They're almost not worth it and sometimes we feel that way. We. We would like to help do something or maybe we, maybe when the offering basket comes around, we, things are tough and things are tight and we just, we just simply don't have a lot to give. But remember the poor widow that put one mite in. It was so small. It seemed so insignificant. So they gathered these vessels together that were just simply willing. And they filled them. And they set them there and they were full as small as they were or as large as they were, they were full and they contained. How willing are we at times? You know, as I was, as I was looking at this again, I thought, but there's, there's a lot of people in society that are, that are willing to help. They don't, they don't even proclaim to be Christians. They're willing to help. They're available. They avail themselves. They're just simply there. But when we come to the end of these three accounts, we'll, we'll see a little bit of difference. <clears throat> did you ever have someone ask you, or did you ever ask someone the question, hey, would you do me a favor? And they say, depends what it is. You know, we seem, we seem to be willing people. But sometimes... You know, even Ananias here was one of God's vessels. And when God called him, he responded right away, Yes, Lord, here I am. But when God gave him his job description, he was not quite sure. 
He, he, he said, I, this man hasn't been, had the best reputation. You know, we're willing to do things when they are okay, when they're easy, or maybe even when they kind of exalt us. We, we're willing to do those things. You know, the, the vessels were, after they were done with selling that oil and giving that away, it doesn't tell us what happened with the vessels. The vessels weren't really important. They were important to contain the uh, contents, but after that it was the contents that they sold. It was the contents that they used and they lived on. <clears throat> so what is our contents that's within us? Are people focusing, do people see what our contents is? Just recently I asked a question, someone, someone uh, mentioned something about those that had, uh, oh and I forget where they were from, but it says that, that they could see that they had been with Jesus. And I said, what did they see? Was it the way they dressed? Was it the way they walked? But I think it was they could see through their hearts, they could see their content. They could see that they had been with Jesus. <clears throat> you know, we could read, we could talk a lot about different people in the Bible that availed themselves simply availed themselves and there was great blessings. We think of, of Philip that went down and met the Enoch. He, he availed himself when God called him and he traveled down there. And yeah, we read that, that Philip was carried away in the spirit, but that's the end of it. But what he did, the contents of what he did, that's, that's the story. And there's, there's a lot of things like that is we know who did it and what they did, but really the contents of the account is what matters and what makes it makes it interesting. <clears throat> the second one that I want to look at is also found in Kings, but it's First King. In First King, chapter seventeen, verse eight through sixteen. <clears throat> 1 King 17, 8 through 16. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise. <clears throat> Here Elijah had been by the brook, and he had been eating uh, locusts and wild honey, and the, well, I guess it was wild honey. And the ravens were bringing him food. And there he was all by himself. And God came to him and he said, <clears throat> after the brook dried up, God came to him in verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, Arise, get thee to Seraphath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Seraphath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in the cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it, for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make, me the, after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she did, went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. <clears throat> this to me looks like quite a challenge. If, if I only had enough for two day, or for one meal, we expect to eat two meals yet today probably, but if I had enough 
for one more little cake. And someone came to me and said, uh, give me some first. What kind of a vessel would I be? Would I be an available vessel? Would I be a willing vessel? Would I be a servant? Would I be willing to give when it looks impossible? <clears throat> you know, we see and we hear so many times that we're willing to do this, we're willing to do that. We, we, we call out that there's a DRS program going and we uh, ask for a hand raise of who would be willing to go. And there's a lot of people that are willing, they, they wanna go. But by the time it's time to schedule, it's, oh, I'm so busy and I'm so busy I can't go. I'm just not, I'm just not available anymore. I'm just not, not available. <clears throat> you know, our family spent two and a half years in Haiti and we had, I think there was three different work projects while we were down there. And uh, we had a real good time with, with crews coming down and pouring concrete and laying block and building buildings. And... But there was a, one young man that stood out to me that he was, he was available when they asked for people to go. He availed himself. And when the time came to to go, he was, he was willing. He was willing. And he got on that airplane and he, he flew to Haiti. And he was with us there and we had a work project going. We had a lot of native people working for us, uh, mixing concrete and doing a lot of things. But how often are we called to do something and we're, when, when, the, when the leather hits the road, our willingness kind of we, we, we find a way of just kind of dismissing ourselves, and we're not there to do the hard work. We're not there to build the church. Yes, we're okay to be a member. We're okay to sit on the back bench. We're okay to not be ordained as a minister. We, we're okay with all of that, and we're grateful for all of that. But how willing are we when it's working time, when it's time to work? You know, one day these the rest of the crew were laying block and they were calling for block and for mud. And I looked around the corner and I see this guy sitting out under a shade tree. And I thought, come on guy, you came all this way for a work project and you're not, not even willing to work. And I called him by name and said, hey, we need this stuff here. And he, he looks around at people and we see all these natives out here. And he says, get some of them guys to do it. Is that our attitude sometimes in the church? There's work to be done. There's, there's so much to be done. But we just aren't willing to step to the plate and to make it happen. We would be available, but we're not willing. We're, we're not servants that are willing to, to work. <clears throat> you know, she was willing to believe when it looked hopeless. How often do we experience things in our personal life, in our community, in, our, in the society, in the world, or maybe in church life? How many times do we experience things that we're called to be a vessel to help through this work and through this project and make things happen or whatever it may be, and we just don't believe there's a way through. We just think it's helpless. It's hopeless. There's no use trying because I don't see my way through. Well, if there ever would have been a, everybody, ever would have been a time for someone to think that there's enough for me and my son, and I'm supposed to give you some first, but it says that she believed when it looked hopeless. She was willing to obey rather than to be selfish. <clears throat> or to say, my way is better. She was willing to give, not of her abundance. But as the widow did with the two mites, she was willing to give everything. And how often do we work through difficult things as a vessel in God's kingdom? And we look back 
and we say the oil stayed. There was a blessing. There's a blessing. We can count. We can see a blessing through this difficult experience because we were unselfish. We were, we were willing to follow through and we were willing to, to obey and to help. <clears throat> Another example is, of this willingness is <clears throat> the account of when Israel was there in the battle and they were fighting down in the valley and Moses was up there with his hands up and he was becoming tired. And you know, it looked, it could have looked so feeble in the midst of a battle for two men to come and just hold his arms up, just to hold his arms up and support him. How much more, how much better would it have been if they would have been down there fighting? But they were simply vessels where God needed them at the time. They were willing to, to uh, obey and to follow. <clears throat> Do we exercise the gifts that we have? You know, sometimes there's, there seems to be a segment of people that focus so much on what your gift is and go out and find what your gift is and that that can be that can be important that can be good but I'd like to challenge you what was Joseph's gift how much was he pursuing his gift or Moses or Daniel they were simply just being faithful where they were. And God saw their faithfulness. God saw their availability. God saw their willingness. And he called them to work. <clears throat> the third one is probably the most important vessel of all. It's, there's, there's two accounts in the Bible that I want to turn to. You know, we might say, well, if I'm available and if I'm willing, what else could there be? What else could God be looking for if I'm willing and available. Well, let, you, let me ask you the question, what about those people out there in the world that you ask them to go on a DRS project? They, don't, they might even complain over, why did God send a tornado through here? Why does he, if he's really God, why does he let things like this happen? But they're still available, and they're still willing to go work on this. They're still willing to help their neighbor out. So is being willing and available enough? Is our, is our efforts that we do, that we, we focus on, is it going to be enough? First of all, let's turn to Judges 7. A few verses in Judges 7. <clears throat> 15 through 21. This is the account when, when uh, Gideon finds himself... Uh, Kind of scared at what's happening, but he, he still went ahead and he was out on the threshing floor, kind of, kind of in secret. He was tr trying to do it in a hiding place, but he was still going about his responsibilities and his duties. Begin reading in 15, that God, God was speaking to him and uh, he told him that he would, he would be the one to lead them out. But God came and spoke to him, and he told them to, to he told him to go see this vision. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he whispered and returned into the host of the Israelites and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into our hand the host of Midian. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow into the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye into the trumpet also, on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp and beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the, and the three companies blew the trumpets, 
and brake their pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands, and the trumpets in their right hands, to, to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fled. We see this great miracle that happened here to Israel through Gideon, through the power of God. There was men here that were holding a pitcher. And I believe in the beginning I said, a pitcher can be a char or a vessel or a, or a, a pitcher or whatever it may be. But here, the pitcher was holding the lamp, was holding the torch. And my challenge to myself and to all of us this morning is, God has called us, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It's the light of the truth within our earthen vessel here. It's God... The Scots light show forth within us. But the important thing about the vessel here was until the vessel was broken, God could not work. God's power was not displayed and the light shone forth. You know, what do we, what, what do we see when we see a person that is willing and that is available, but then he's also broken? It doesn't matter to him who gets the honor or who gets the glory. But the word of God has, has been blessed and has been enlarged. <clears throat> In Psalm 119 it says, the word is, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light, un, a light unto my feet and a path un, lamp unto my path. Are we passing that torch? Are we carrying that torch? Is our hearts broken that the world can see it? that the things that happen and transpire in our lives, that the power of God can be displayed. You know, there were, there were many vessels in the Bibles that, that I didn't mention of, and there was, there was one of them that I have to think of, uh, the, the little maid, Naaman and the little maid. You know, this little maid was taught the truth of God. And when she came over to the land there with Naaman, she said, there's a God back in, in Israel. There's a God back in Israel. And we know through that little message that this little girl brought, Naaman was healed and he said, there is none other God but the God of Israel. But the interesting thing about it is, whatever happened with the little girl? We don't know. So how important is it for us to receive honor and glory for the things that we have done? You know, we here about a half year ago when the, the captives were in, in, in Haiti, you know, we gathered together every night to pray. And we prayed and we prayed and we said, you know, we are a people that we like to see action. Come on, God, just bring them out. Let a miracle happen. And it seemed that once we were kind of done with ourselves, then God moved in a miraculous way. Of delivering them. I asked, I asked Samuel Stolzfus and Matt, Matt Miller from our church was one of them. Samuel Stolzfus was in our church one day and I asked him, I said, I kind of got sidetracked. Anyway, I asked him, how did it feel that short distance from the building to the woods? He said, very tense. But God delivered in a miraculous way because, because there were a lot of vessels that were praying and that were, were interceding for them. <clears throat> you know, David said, after he had prayed to God and confessed his shortcomings and his sins with Bathsheba, he said, thou desirest not sacrifice. It's not only that we're willing, or else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering, things that I could do and perform and but he said, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You know, if we're a vessel that is willing and that is available, but we're broken, we're simply working for the kingdom of God. All we want to do is do something 
that the church can grow and the church can prosper and the church can build. It wasn't me, but God has blessed us. In Acts 9, we have another account of a vessel. Think, think for the sake of time, I'm not going to read that. Uh, we'll just turn to that in Acts 9. It's a fairly lengthy account. Excuse me. Double up my pages. It's not in Acts 9, it's in Mark. Mark 14. Skip one page here. Mark 14. Three through nine. Here we have some of the some of the disciples with with Jesus there, and and being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leopard, as he sat to meet, at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box, and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within them, themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence, and have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble you her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do to them ye may do them good. But me ye will not always have. But me ye have not always. She hath done that she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also, shall be, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial of her. Here we see the account of, of Jesus and this woman coming with this little vessel. And I imagine if it had that expensive ointment in it, it was probably not just any vessel. It was probably an expensive vessel. I don't know, was it made out of glass or of marble or what it was, but it was a precious vessel, I expect, to have to have been to hold that. But we see the account that she had the possession of this, but until that vessel was broken. And I believe it was here or in another place where it says that the aroma filled the whole house. So how does our broken life, how does our broken heart, how does our broken vessel, how does that portray the, the aroma of the love of God in our home, in our families, in our churches, in the community, in society, when we are of a broken and a contrite heart? The last thing, one of the last things that I want to mention here is of these last two accounts that we looked at, these vessels that were broken, what happened with the vessels? They probably fell to the ground, they were trampled over, they were done with. Are we willing? Are we willing to be a vessel that is broken that maybe people won't recognize us for what we did? Maybe people will trample over us for what we did. But did it bring honor and glory to God? Are we willing? Are we satisfied to be a vessel that is just broken and contrite? In closing, I have to think of 1 Corinthians 13, the last verse. Last verse. And now abideth availability, willingness, and brokenness. These three, but the greatest of these is brokenness. Lord bless you.
All right, thank you for that message, Steve. I guess Bert wanted me to come up here because I claim him as a brother-in-law also, maybe once removed. Anyway, um, thank you for that message on being a vessel. I jotted down I am a vessel, but am I a broken vessel? You know, a vessel is only good for, as we heard, containing something, but there's times when that vessel gets emptied. And it's where we fill our vessel that makes a difference. So we go and we get filled at the source and our responsibility is to go to pour out. A vessel is always used to pour out or to be broken. And we go back to the source because we're empty. We get filled and then we go and we just pour out again. That's all a vessel is used for. To get filled up, to pour out. So you got filled this morning. This week we go pour out, all right? So thank you for coming. I say welcome visitors. Feel free to stay and share the noon meal together here. And um, I suppose there'll be some sort of structured way of going through the line we'll find out in there. And um, I'm gonna ask you all to stand at this time for closing prayer, remembering the noon meal. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, a day of opportunity, of peace, to gather in this way, to hear a word from you. And Lord, I trust that we have all heard a word from you that was inspiring, that was speaking to us. Thank you for Brother Steve and his willingness to come and to be a vessel and to pour out. And Lord, I pray that we would be those broken vessels this week, that what you have put into our lives and our hearts, we would therefore pour out to others to minister willingly. Thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for the noon meal. We thank you for the food, the way that you prepare or the provide for us and that our needs are met. And I just pray, Lord, that you would bless the food and bless our fellowship and our afternoon together, that we would all be strengthened and encouraged. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And consider yourselves dismissed. <laughs>